After the Armageddon. We are about to explore a time 100 million years after the late Anthropocene mass extinction event commonly known as Armageddon. Our first stop in this journey is here on the southern coast of Dalmar, a huge mountainous island that rises over what used to be eastern Tanzania, with more than 300 square kilometers in size and completely covered by a dense tropical jungle is the largest landmass in the archipelago of Somali, an extensive set of islands that rise over what used to be eastern Africa. The geographic changes of this region aren't really a matter tectonic activity but climate, we are in the middle of a thermal maximum, all the ice caps of the planets have melted and the sea levels are higher than ever before, huge extensions of swaps cover Asia, internal oceans can be found in South America, Australia and Antarctica, and part of Africa and Europe have become islands. Each one of these islands allow for the development of several endemic species that isolated from the from the competition of the mainland megafauna have managed to diversify in a wide arrangement of new forms. The first one of the species we encounter is a large aquatic bird resting in the shore. This is an adult goliath penguin. By the size we can tell it is a female. This species of penguin has a notorious sexual dimorphism and is the largest of all the archipelago, with females averaging 70 centimeters in height and males reaching up to 1.5 meters. They are found both in Dalmar and in Madagascar, with sandy beaches as their preferred nesting grounds. The Goliath penguin spends most of the day either resting inside small burrows, coming out at the first hours of the day to forage for food, and generally coming back to the beach to take a short nap every one or two hours and retreating to their burrows before the sun starts to set down, when females are incubating an egg the time of foraging might get reduced to less than two hours per day, as the more time the egg is unprotected, bigger the risk of a land predator attacking the nest, and herein. Delmar, there are many opportunists that would enjoy making a meal out of an egg or a small chick, so it's better to always keep an eye on them. Maternity is particularly stressful for this species as unlike most other living species of penguin, they do not normally form couples. Large males will most often claim large extensions of the beaches used as nesting grounds and mate will all the females that have their burrows near their territory. Fights for territory and mating rights between adult males are quite common and extremely vicious. The wings that are muscular enough to make them move across the ocean at a speed of 30 kilometers per hour are powerful enough as to break ribs when used in interspecific combat, their beaks that can crush the hard exoskeleton of crabs and shrimps, are capable of cause gruesome bleeding wounds on their opponents and even the claws on their feet, normally used to cling on rocks when coming back from the sea, become slashing weapons, all of this in order to pass on their genes to the next generation. However aside from participating in battles that most often then not end up with one of the participants either death or two wounded to defend itself from predators, some smaller males would instead try to focus their attention on a single female and nest in a less populated area, generally small caves in rocky beaches or estuaries, exposed to crashing waves or even more predators, but free of competition. After mating, the female will lay a single egg, that will take around 20 days and incubate, the chick is born very small and frail, and will not leave the safety of the nest for at least two months. During this time, the mother will feed it with regurgitated predigested fish, with time she will start bringing whole fish and shrimps. Once the chick changes its plumage, it will start accompanying its mother to forage out in the ocean. At the six months of age, it will be completely independent, ready to navigate the treacherous waters of the archipelago. While there are many dangerous predators here interested in making a meal out of these penguins, this 8 meters long carnivorous reptile is unexpectedly not one of them. This is a garagundo, one of the largest marine crocodiles alive, and a specialist in durophagy. On a good day, a fully grown adult, like this one can eat almost 2,000 mussels. However this female is far away from her traditional feeding grounds, she has traveled almost 3,000 kilometers from the southern Atlantic, to the archipelago, with just one goal in mind, lay her eggs in the same river she was born more than 20 years ago, the travel will be treacherous, 
and upon arrival she will have to compete with dozens of other females for a good nesting spot. But for her none of these sacrifices are too much, as the river will offer all the protection her offspring needs to reach adulthood, the little garagundos will spend their first years of life feeding in small crustaceans, insects, and frogs, just once they grow too big for the river's ecosystem to keep supporting their appetite they will adventure into the open ocean, this is their most vulnerable stage, very few survive the transition between being the largest predator of their nursery river, to one of the smallest of the sea. The ones that survive the transition will eventually reach a size that will put them again, outside of the reach of almost any predator, with females averaging 2 tons and males being able to grow up to 3.5 tons, they are larger than any living species of shark, except the filter feeder ones, and larger than most species of marine reptile, however for the time being these hatchlings are still small and frail, no larger than a perch, and struggling to catch even small insects. Actually this one just lost a prey item to a fly, a killfly to be more specific, the southern brown killfly is one of the most common small predators in Africa's swamps and rivers, with a wingspan of around 12 centimeters they might look feeble, but if we go for the success rate of their hunts, they are even more lethal than tigers or lions, also they have been observed to take on prey more than four times bigger than them. The killfly family is a diverse clade of insects belonging to the order Diptera, Within the mosquito family tree, they can be found in Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, and eastern Antarctica, filling a role similar to the one of dragonflies or wasps, feeding on smaller flying insects, tadpoles, spiders, and caterpillars. While hunting the killfly will use its superior speed and maneuverability to catch prey mid-flight and use its long legs to keep it at a distance where it can't fight back, then they will use a proboscis to inject a complex chemical cocktail that will dissolve the innards of their prey, then they sit down on a leaf or twig and take their time to enjoy a pleasant warm soup and rest their tired wings. The Souther Brown Killfly is on the large side for a killfly, they have been observed to kill even small birds or bats, and can endure quite long travels, this why they have colonized most of the Somali archipelago, they have a few predators of their own, including large bats, birds of prey, and even some lizards, in this particular island they sometimes fell prey to this. The Eastern Naga, a strange agamid lizard adapted to an arboreal lifestyle similar in some ways to the of a cave python or a chameleon, they remain immobile on a tree branch, using their long and muscular prehensile tail to hold their body weight, while waiting for an insect or small vertebrate to pass nearby, then they lash out in a single quick movement and catch it with their jaws, full of tiny sharp conical teeth, helping themselves with their hands to shovel the prey down their throat. These animals can be only found in this island, their closest relatives that live both in the northern island of Kanata, what's left of Kenya, and Madagascar and are small fast-running animals with well-developed hind limbs, so these creatures develop all their adaptation after getting isolated here, that being around the last 25 million years. Males are easily differentiated from females as they are the only ones with at least somewhat functional hind limbs that are used to grab onto the female while mating. They are also generally smaller and during mating season at least brightly colored. After mating females will lay between 20 and 30 eggs the size of a grape in a small hole in the ground or a crevice between the rocks and abandon them, the eggs hatch after a month and the babies are fully independent from the start, they will feed on small insects and worms, hunting in small bushes and in between tall grasses, only going up to the trees once they surpass the 20 centimeters in length, around the 6 months of age. We continue walking through the forest, and eventually we spot another ambush hunter endemic to the island, but this one is much smaller, this is a giant thorny beetle, well a larvae of the species, these little creatures can measure up to 2 inches in length and are commonly found in between the foliage, they unlike the adults that are strict herbivores, feed on a variety of small flying insects like flies, mosquitoes and moths. They larvae is born very small, no bigger than the head of a pin. Their first meal are the same eggs they were born from and sometimes some of their less developed siblings, after this they will crawl out of the hole they were born and spend the first days of its life feeding on small isopods, worms, centipedes, and tiny detritivorous beetles that live in the soil, once they reach the centimeter in length, they will start adventuring into the foliage, eating aphids, and small folivorous larvae of other species of beetle, eventually when they reach the inch in. Size they develop a game-changing ability. They will secrete a sticky and sweet-smelling substance from their rear end, 
this substance will attract pollinators and frugivorous insects and not only that, it will trap them making them unable to fly away, allowing the larvae to take as much time as it needs to feed on prey sometimes almost as big as itself. They can live for up to five years in this state, waiting for the right conditions to make their metamorphosis and left behind their hunting days, transforming into folivorous adults, these adults will feed of a wide variety of plants, they are slow walking and clumsy when flying, only ever doing it if a predator attacks them, however if they manage get a hold of them as likely they will spit them out as the beetle is covered in hundreds of tiny spines that can deter even a hungry lizard or shrew, some birds however have beaks strong enough to break through this defense mechanism. We continue walking through the dense jungle, it's 3 p.m. and the temperatures are reaching above 40 degrees Celsius, we decide to rest for a bit and drink something, suddenly in the same clearing we are resting a large reptile appears. This is a Dalmarian Draco, one of the largest terrestrial vertebrates of the island, descendant of the ancient Nile crocs that could be found in most of sub-Saharan Africa in the days of men, they have completely abandoned their ancestors' aquatic lifestyle in exchange for becoming fully terrestrial creatures, several member of their family can be found through all Africa, both the large western continent and the eastern archipelago, and are one of the most successful groups of reptiles alive. The large crocodile notices our presence, but decides to ignore us. He is here looking for food, but a group of strange-looking large mammals might be too much of a hassle, and there is plenty of fruit around so there is no point in exhausting himself. The Dalmarian Draco is an omnivore and only around 30% of its diet is made out of meat, similar to the now extinct bears they will walk long distances looking for berries, digging out tubers, and even eating some soft grasses and leaves, as well as insects, earthworms, fishes, carrier and only occasionally actively hunting small mammals or flightless birds. While their bite force would be enough to break the neck of an animal, the size of a red deer, they prefer prey that doesn't struggle too much. While males do not generally participate in the rearing of their young, they do help building a nest, just like in Anthropocene crocs, this consists in a huge pile of decomposing vegetation, they lay between 4 and 10 eggs that take around 3 to 4 months to hatch, upon hatching the babies will start calling her mother with high-pitched sounds similar to a dog toy. Females will then dig them out and clean them, rubbing and nuzzling them as the first bonding experience with their mother, she will for up to five years take care of all their needs, feeding them regurgitated food, snuggling them to sleep, protecting them from predators and teaching them how to hunt and find food, despite how strong are their family bonds several dracos will die before their first year of life, especially the most reckless ones, once they are big enough to fend for themselves they will go live on their own, and while they do, not form groups, they will remember their parents and siblings through all their lives, showing no signs of territoriality or aggression towards the ones they recognize as members of their own family. We leave the crocs and start heading toward the mountains, these are actually the same Lupanga mountains that already existed in the days of man, is here where we can find one of the largest mammals of the island, the Balubalu, a large arboreal mustelid that are directly descendants from the ancient Mongolian conics, they are some of the few bear-like mustelids that are still around. They are almost completely herbivorous, more than 70% of their diet is composed of fruits, they also use their muscular jaws and wide molars to grind down tough nuts, fibrous vegetation including leaves and the stem of some small palm species, and just occasionally they will also incorporate insects to their diet, bees, and termites being among their most preferred choices. They are very peaceful creatures, while not very social, they almost never fight, only ignoring each other if they ever cross paths, when a male encounters a female in heat they will almost always just wait for her to approach first, males have a very strong smell so if a female is at less than 10 meters away she will certainly notice their presence, once she approaches they will exhibit themselves, standing on their hind limb and showing their canines to impress her, after a few minutes of these they will mate and part ways immediately, the female will give birth to a single cub six months later, the cub will remain with her for at least three years, learning survival skills and relying on her for food and affection. The slow and peaceful lifestyle of the Balubalu can be explained as a mix of the vast abundance of food in its environment as well as the lack of predators or any other large dangerous animal in its environment, letting these creatures live with relative leisure compared to their mainland counterparts. We are about to leave the island, but before we arrive to the camp to collect our belongings we stumble upon a massive reptile a fully grown male behemoth tortoise, this animal might be a herbivore, 
but for its sheer size it can be dangerous to approach, the animal slowly walks toward us. Inflating the air sac on its throat and producing a low guttural sound, it's clearly angry, and looking behind the armored beast we can see a large herd of tortoises, this male is most likely protecting his mate and offspring, thankfully is too slow to actually catch up to us. These reptiles are gregarious creatures, living in groups of up to 40 individuals, with no social hierarchy, the groups are composed by several males and several females as well as a few juveniles, each year different groups will gather in the mountains to nest, sometimes more than 200 individuals will reunite in the same site, they will dig out huge burrows and lays around 30 eggs per mating pair, the eggs are around the size of a ping pong ball, soft shelled and develop very slow, so a lot of egg thieves will assault these nests, very few of them will survive, and the ones that hatch will take several years before reaching adulthood. Around 5% of the embryos in these eggs will become adults, however the ones that reach adulthood outsize most of the island's predators and are therefore able to live long lives. Some of the oldest members of this herd are around 200 years old, the oldest documented individual reached 230 years, and was still healthy and active until a few weeks before passing away, making them the longest-lived vertebrate alive. We finally leave the herd behind and go back to the coast, we set sail away from Dalmer, to continue exploring what has been of the world, 100 million years after the extinction of mankind.